Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's good that it is cooling off a little bit. Boy, it was hot over the weekend. You can actually feel it. This room is a little warm. I'll give everybody a five-minute warning in order to have the three minutes. Okay, good. Thanks, Michelle. Good. So I'll be going through and talking about uh, broadly the state of uh, what we've been doing collectively over many, many years now for galaxies uh, in the first billion years or so. Centered around Hubble, but Spitzer has been playing a major role and increasingly ground-based telescopes are moving into that arena as well. And it's remarkable, I think that 25th anniversary of Hubble's launch was this year. An amazing telescope, 25 years and still going good. And uh, we're hoping another five years or more. And so, a remarkable, hopefully 30, we'll get to a 30th birthday and uh, have a party there as well. So, I'd like to highlight the folks I've been working with over the years, of course. There's a great team that uh, we have had the honor, privilege, and uh, learned a lot from. My particular collaborators, Richard Bowens, Pashal Ersch, and uh, Eva LeBay. Richard is here, I think, too, giving a talk later on. A uh, great group of folks to work with. And so let me uh, set the stage a little, going back to a very nice chart that Brant Robertson put together for a Nature article in uh, 2010, just uh, sort of broadly showing the, you know, the trend of activities with time. This is the region where I'll be concentrating on for much of the new discoveries that are being made on in galaxies at early times. And uh, this is uh, out through to Redshift 6, the first giga year. Reionization ended around redshift 6. Uh, as Planck has shown us, the instantaneous redshift reionization is around 8.8 .8 or 9. Wonderful result from Planck. Amazing results, actually. It was a remarkable telescope. And so here we are pushing out with Hubble, 2.4 meter telescope, and then with Spitzer, an even smaller telescope, out to nearly redshift 11. This is quite astonishing. I think. Fifteen years ago, if you would said that uh, these telescopes would be probing this regime, I think we all would have been extremely skeptical, probing it at the level of detail that we're actually doing. But it is uh, astonishing that how powerful they have been. Let me just give you an image of what these galaxies look like. We talk about these in sort of very round terms, you know, 10,000 galaxies of Redshift 4 from photometric Redshift surveys. These are the sort of data we have. This is as good as it gets. So there's not a huge amount of information here. Fortunately, we have lots of information on colors. They are resolved largely, so we measure sizes, etc. But detailed structure is very poorly understood. And I'll show you one of the best examples later on. Very little data, even with high magnification regions in cluster. So key aspects of the galaxies in the first year, you know, how, where we look, how we find them, sizes, colors, luminosity distributions, luminosity functions, masses, their role in reionization, earliest known galaxies. There's a lot of topics here, far more than I can cover in a 20-minute talk. And Richard is going to focus on reionization and uh, the distribution over luminosity as well. And I'll cover various aspects of these. I sort of give you a broad picture of the state of galaxies. So let me just... Uh, so looking for large samples, finding large samples, this is a statistical game and we really need those samples. Fortunately, over the years, Hubble has done an amazing job in doing surveys, starting out with advanced, particularly when the advanced camera came along with its high efficiency and larger area than wide field camera too. Good survey, the very deep ones, the Hubble ultra deep field, and ultimately when we put all that together in the XCF, Candles, a superb survey. There have been surveys of clusters, starting with CLASH, actually starting with the advanced camera team, put together a lot of data on clusters, frontier fields, and the parallel data sets. These have been the basis of what we've been doing. But I wanted to show you this slide, because it uh, is a very interesting one from uh, Piero and Mark's uh, nice review last year. And uh, I don't remember, Piero, what's the model that's under here? It's an 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember which particular one it was. It doesn't matter a whole lot. I mean. Okay. So this is interesting to look at. And so particularly because these yellow regions are the candles fields. These little squares here are a single Hubble pointing. The Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the HDF North region. We clearly have a cosmic variance problem with these surveys. It's a real challenge, actually. And there are very large variations. And when we come to clusters with their high magnifications, the selection volumes, the source plane volumes, become even smaller than this. So we're subject to very large variances. We need lots of pointings and lots of fields. And we already we see lots of differences in candles alone. And that is our sort of biggest areas where we have extensive coverage. So one of the things that we really do need is WFIRST. Here is sort of schematically the area of an instantaneous image on WFIRST. This is nice, substantially larger. So that will wonderfully complement the depth that we've been getting from Hubble. Nice image put together by the Candles team, just showing the regions, the Candles fields. I added the frontier fields here. A dozen pointings to each per field, per cluster. Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the really the deepest one image that we have managed to get with Hubble and with Spitzer in the region. So large fields by the standards of uh, this uh, telescope, but still not as large as we would like, for sure. Clusters playing an increasing role in, uh, the, in the context of uh, distant galaxies in uh, finding deep, faint samples. And uh, these go back some time. This is an interesting object that was uh, discussed back many years ago. Um, and uh, a highly magnified source. These have been known for a long time as a source of very interesting high redshift objects. But it, this game has come into its own with the clash clusters and the, particularly with the frontier fields. But the region in the sky that has really been the focus of a huge amount of telescope time from all the great observatories is this region, the Chandra Deep Field South, good south region. Chandra, Spitzer, Hubble have all spent a huge amount of time on this. And in fact, as you total up the time, these are all public data sets, 15 million seconds has been spent in this particular little region of sky. It's an amazing resource with its multi-wavelength panchromatic uh, data sets that are available there. Now, we're still being de deriving new data sets from these. There's a huge amount of archival data that actually has never been combined in these fields. And so there's actually four more deep fields, not as deep as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and not with the same filter coverage as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, but deep fields in their own right that are very valuable. And we're just releasing these uh, data sets now to Mars, so they'll be available for everybody to work with in the same way that the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field XCF data set has been available for everybody as a resource. And this is, of course, the field that I have a particular love for because of its depth and uh, the remarkable images that we have from this. And just the amount of time that has been spent on this, two million seconds on this one little single pointing with Hubble in total, with various programs, particularly the infrared ones, but then with uh, more so with the, uh, do something then, with the uh, advanced camera supernova searches have added a substantial amount of data to this field. And uh, just to give you a sense of this is one of the reasons why these data sets sit in archives for a long time. They are hard to put together. The data sets are overlapping different angles, different over levels of overlap. And so everything has to be worked through in very great detail to make this come together and to be a useful, well-structured, well-calibrated, well-aligned data set. So let me just walk on to redshifts and talk a little about this before I show some of the latest results. Of course, from the ground, we can go measure Lyman and Alpha. It's a very powerful tool, but not all galaxies show Lyman Alpha strongly, and particularly as we get into the reionization period epic when there's more neutral hydrogen, it's becoming increasingly harder to find galaxies with Lyman Alpha. The core of what all we've been doing, uh, done, and this is pretty much everybody working in this field, of course, is using photometric redshifts, Lyman break galaxies. 
there's a role for Hubble Grism too. The Grism surveys are actually very powerful. And I don't think we've fully exploited the capabilities there as much as one would like. So just a quick visual graphic of uh, how we select these galaxies. So basically the Lyman limit, Lyman break around as we go out to high redshift. You can see the ultimate limit with Hubble is around 12. We run out of filters, out of data at that point. But uh, the, uh, in fact, I'm sure I was going to do this again. It is really nice to go with these filters that go basically from redshift three right out through a wide range of redshift. So from basically two, the first two billion years are covered by the advanced camera and by the infrared camera. And of course, with a wide field camera th um, three, uh, with, the, uh, H, with the UV data from the new wide field camera, we also can now go down to redshift one, as I'll show you later too. Now, Spitzer adds an interesting dimension to this. And this is, in many ways, relatively new. Spitzer is a really challenging telescope to work with. This is what the PSF looks like. It's really crappy. It's uh, <laughs> large and very messy. But, and this worried a lot of folks about how we were actually going to work on faint objects with Spitzer. As it turns out, and when you have high-resolution imaging data, like from Hubble, you can actually do an extraordinarily good job of removing contaminating sources in Spitzer if you're looking for measuring the fluxes in one particular source. And there's an excellent example here. So the location of the source is determined from the wide field camera data. It's this object here. Everything else in the field is basically mapped and removed. And there's the residual. Very good. Spitzer has very nice detectors, but I don't want to underestimate the challenges of putting all this together and doing this in a sort of multi-dimensional way and removing those uh, data. But Evo LeBay has done a remarkable job, and others are now doing that as well. So the reason I bring this up is because as we've looked at lower redshift galaxies, we've realized there are a lot of the star-forming galaxies that have very strong emission lines, 1,000 angstroms equivalent with rest frame or more. These are strong enough that they can influence broadband filters. And so when Renske Schmidt and Richard Bowens started looking at a lot of the infrared, uh, the IRAC data from Spitzer, realizing there are very unusual colors in many of the objects they were seeing, very blue. So the 3.6 band was much brighter than the 4.5 in some instances. And they realized this is, could well be because of the strong emission lines. And here's just sort of an example of three data sets. So for a ratio of seven galaxies, no flux essentially in the, infrared, in the optical advanced camera. The wide field camera, three fluxes measuring right around the, just a little redwood of uh, Lyman Alpha. And then out in the nebula region where the nebula emission lines can influence the fluxes, you really see a dramatic effect in the Spitzer data, which was assumed that point to be, you know, maybe we really are looking at strong emission lines. A bit more thinking about this actually showed how this happened and actually how valuable it is for establishing at some redshift ranges the redshift. So here are H alpha, oxygen 3, very strong features that are moving through these two infrared filters, so IRAC filters from Spitzer. And so redshift 6.5, both of them contribute to the flux. You get to redshift 6.8, only one of these is contributing anymore. And you see this very blue color. Then as you go a little longer, you start to see a stronger 4.5 micron, a rather red looking object. And so they realized that as they plotted up the colors, that they had a very useful redshift discriminant just in this broadband data from Spitzer combined with the uh, optical and infrared data from Hubble. And so this remarkable ability to pull out uh, samples with redshifts actually that are good enough to do follow up with ALMA, which is important as it's needed for much of the work there. So one of the things I wanted to comment on was you see these objects with not a great deal of structure. And one of the first objects that was found at high redshift, which remarkably turns out to still be the best one, was this found in Whitefield Camera 2 way back in 1997, this fold arc. 
in this cluster 1358. And uh, a reconstruction then showed most of the flux, this was half of the flux was in this single blob of star formation, a few hundred parsecs in size. Um, as more data was obtained with the uh, wide field camera, Zytron, uh, sorry, with the advanced camera, Zytron put together a much nicer reconstruction and with uh, more modeling, very highly magnified object. But this is one of the rare examples of uh, telling us what an object or objects of this high redshift star forming objects might actually look like. As it turns out, even after all the clash clusters, after all the advanced camera clusters, one of the first programs we did on that was look at 30 different clusters and we did not find another example that was as good as this. This remains the best example, even after the frontiers, frontier fields and all. It would be really nice to have more of these highly magnified sources where one could see what the structure was like in these galaxies. Sorry? No, one. This is the fold arc. So here's the fold arc, in, and then here is a magnify, a, a blown up view of it with this galaxy removed. Let me just go back, actually. So fold arc, galaxy was removed. So that's just the fold arc. Then a reconstruction from a mass model of the cluster gave this is the source plane structure of the object. And then when Zytron went and took the advanced camera data and got a much nicer reconstruction. And so, yeah, this is basically how it looks. This actually is what looking at an, uh, these objects with a 30 meter telescope and AO would be like. This would be good. Then we will get a lot of these. But currently the clusters finding such magnified sources is very rare. Okay, so let me walk on now to into the regime of the highest redshifts. So now we're talking about as galaxies essentially only appear in the infrared data sets. But it's still crucial to have the optical data sets because of contamination problems, getting rid of the lower redshift contaminating galaxies. Then of course with new spectrographs, particularly like MOSFIRE, we're actually now able to do and measure Lyman alpha redshifts in some of the brightest galaxies. which was an unfortunate discovery as well that we actually could find such bright galaxies. So here is one of the galaxies that was for a short period the highest redshift object that had been confirmed. The photometric redshift was actually remarkably good. This is also reassuring given how reliant we are on the photometric redshifts that with the Spitzer data and uh, using the emission lines again, we could narrow this down to 7.7, .7, went to Keck, MOSFIRE, took a spectrum, and Lyman Alpha showed up at 7.73. And so, as I said, this was the highest redshift uh, confirmed galaxy, I think, for a couple of months. Because just recently, this new one has come out actually from the same data set. This is from the, uh, the very bright objects found across the Candles fields by uh, Richard and the team. And uh, there's another object at 7.5. So MOSFIRE playing a real role here in getting high redshift galaxies and the very bright ones. Okay. Unusual objects, these very bright objects. And uh, so let me jump on because I want to cover a little bit the redshift 10 galaxies. These are a sample that um, were found last year too. 26 magnitude redshift 10 galaxies. The Spitzer data measured and detected in Spitzer again, dramatically brighter than uh, what had been found before at Redshift 10. Unusual objects, uh, we're finding these bright ones. They're rare, but uh, the likelihood they're at high Redshift, at Redshift 10 is very high. If uh, you're using the photometric Redshifts and what we know about these galaxies, very unlikely to be contaminating sources. Stellar masses around 10 to the 9 solar masses. So at this point, the highest redshift object is 10.7. This is in one of the clash clusters. This is sort of approaching the limit to what Hubble will ever do. So we need JWST to go on from here. Why do we care about these objects? What is interesting is that we're looking at um, the trends in star formation rate density as a function of time. Redshift, here we go out to redshift eight. The, as we started to accumulate data at earlier times, we started to find a break that started to find a lower star formation rate densities than one might think of would be appropriate from a simple extrapolation of the early ones. 
And uh, this was somewhat controversial. There aren't that many points there, but uh, we've been trying to add to the sample and to improve that. And uh, here now is we're using some data from the four frontier field clusters. And uh, again, the data, essentially every point that we have falls below this simple-minded extrapolation. Now, this is not really unexpected, though there is dispersion here in the models. Basically, this drop was expected from looking at the dark halo mass functions, but uh, it has been controversial, and there are folks, here's an example of a model, which uh, suggests maybe not as much drop as we're seeing. So again, more data would be good on this, but uh, I think the data that we're getting is increasingly confirming that there's a, a break in the star formation rate density <coughs> around redshift 8, and a significant drop as you go out to redshift 10. So that's a, going from 650 to sort of 450 to 500 million years. So what's next? There's still an awful lot to be done. Now obviously ALMA provides new capability, dramatic new capability, new spectrographs on these telescopes, 30 meter telescopes, but even these two together over the next few years until JWST comes along will be adding to the data set. One area where we really would like to get good data is in the ultraviolet with Wide Field Camera 3. When Hubble goes, we won't have this ultraviolet capability. JWST doesn't have that. So there's a lot of interest in building up surveys that give us information on comparable star-forming galaxies at redshift one or so. And so this survey is in good south, good north, and uh, is providing some very nice data, but it is challenge working, challenging working in the ultraviolet. There's not a huge amount of signal down there, but it's still very valuable data, and particularly because we can, within one data set, cover not only the UV, we can go into the optical, which we cannot do at high redshift until JWST comes along. So there's a panchromatic aspect to working on these uh, similarly selected star-forming galaxies around redshift one. And then one of the things we'll obviously want to look at here is looking at the colors of these objects and comparing the trends that we've now collectively, and many people have been involved in this over the last few years, looking at uh, the color changes as a function of luminosity. Largely dust driven, then you know, related back to metals. So let me quickly, last couple of minutes here, um, go through and uh, just mention some more Spitzer data that's coming in as well. So the deep Spitzer data is incredibly valuable, as I've indicated before, but uh, particularly for looking at masses too, as well as increasingly for redshifts. Spitzer, even as tiny size, we actually in the sort of 100 to 200 hour data sets can detect individual redshift eight galaxies, 650 million year galaxies. And uh, what the, we're doing now through this GREATS program led by EVO is to look over large areas in significant areas in good south and goods north to 200 hours depth and uh, reach down to 27th magnitude three sigma. And so this will be very valuable for looking at uh, and deriving masses. You know, it's quite striking that, um, you know, we're already setting mass density evolution in the universe out to redshift 10. And basically at a time when the first 10th of a percent of the stellar mass was being put in place. So it's good to be doing that, but one of the challenges is that uh, we've had to use UV data calibrated by Spitzer as much as possible to derive mass masses. This is risky, particularly because of this nice little schematic. Dust saturates the UV, so there's a point where a certain um, luminosity, you know, that you can be double valued. You're just not sure whether you're ma looking at a massive dusty object or a low, uh, less massive, not very dusty object. This is a problem, and um, it I think is leading to. You know, I think we actually do not understand well what the mass functions are at these high redshifts at this point because of the lack of good Spitzer data and having to use the UV. So hopefully, this new survey will improve this. This, of course, is something which. JWST will give us a huge gain on as well very quickly. Okay, so let me just wrap it up basically. So uh, here's JWST, probably in a little different 
visualization than you may well have usually seen. This poster was up, put up by Northrop Grumman in a station near the Pentagon. Northrop Grumman does a lot of things that they can't advertise. In fact, the vast majority of their work is uh, in areas that they can't talk about. So they like to show what they actually were doing, but in a sense, fitting with the Pentagon mentality, I would say. But this will be amazingly powerful. And uh, every time I look at this, I'm impressed with even how amazingly powerful it will be relative to anything that we've been doing before. We're on track to launch in October 2018, as long as the government doesn't shut down. This will be disruptive. But we have no control over that. So anyway, at this point, I say we've done, we collectively as a community using Hubble and uh, using Spitzer have done amazingly well in exploring out to very early times. And uh, basically, I think this repeats what I've said, and I just wanted to advertise a, uh, another conference in uh, Aspen in uh, next March as well, uh, Reionization Epic, and uh, always a very pleasant place to be in early March. The skiing is always good, but of course, that's not much of a motivation, is it? We're really there for the science. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. At these epochs, I, one, I would love to establish the mass functions way better. I mean, of course, I think what's always on the front of everybody's mind is we just want to push out to redshift 12, 14, 15. You know, where, where are the earliest galaxies we can detect? So that's the, you know, I think the fun part of JWSC, the exciting part. But I would really like to establish good masses for galaxies and uh, we will have some improved resolution that will help too in understanding more about these particular objects. But very rapidly, we will build up huge samples compared to what we can do with Hubble. As you saw at Redshift 9 and 10, 11, it's extraordinarily hard. You know, we have something like 30 or 40 galaxies of those redshifts. It's hard to do substantial, significant statistical studies on small samples like that. And if we were limited just to Hubble and Spitzer for, and with no JWST, we might double that or triple it before they go, but never enough to be significant. So JWST will just change the game dramatically in galaxies in the first, I would say, three or 400 million years. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think that'll always be an open question. I mean, we never, JWST is not going to see single first stars. So, you know, the smallest matter of doing, I actually don't know off the top of my head, the redshift 20, what, uh, how many, what luminosity JWST could reach. Richard, do you know? You looked at this, I remember, at one point. And, uh, but anyway, you know, it's, we're never going to get, this is the first galaxy type answer. We're going to get, you know, this is where we're at at redshift 15. And uh, we've set limits at, you know, higher redshift. Okay, just last question. Don't quote me, though, to Congress on this, because we've gone around selling first light, first galaxy. So. <laughs> Any question before the discussion is oh, you got it. Good. Otherwise, thank you very much. Again. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, is very poorly understood, and I'll show you one of the best examples later in very little data, even with high magnification regions in cluster. So, key aspects of the galaxies in the first year, you know, how, where we look, how we find them, sizes, colors, luminosity distributions, luminosity functions, masses, their role in reionization, 
earliest known galaxies. There's a lot of topics here, far more than I can cover in a 20-minute talk. And Richard is going to focus on reionization and uh, the distribution over luminosity as well. And I'll cover various aspects of these. I sort of give you a broad picture of the state of galaxies. So let me just... Uh, so looking for large samples, finding large samples, this is a statistical game and we really need those samples. Fortunately, over the years, Hubble has done an amazing job in doing surveys, starting out with advanced, particularly when the advanced camera came along with its high efficiency and larger area than wide field camera too. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's good that it is cooling off a little bit. Boy, it was hot over the weekend. You can actually feel it. This room is a little warm. I'll give everybody a five-minute warning in order to have the three minutes again. Okay, good. Thanks, Michelle. Good. So I'll be going through and talking about uh, broadly the state of uh, what we've been doing collectively over many, many years now for galaxies uh, in the first billion years or so. Centered around Hubble, but Spitzer has been playing a major role and increasingly ground-based telescopes are moving into that arena as well. And it's remarkable, I think that 25th anniversary of Hubble's launch was this year. An amazing telescope, 25 years and still going good. And uh, we're hoping another five years or more. And so... A remarkable, hopefully 30, we'll get to a 30th birthday and uh, have a party there as well. So I'd like to highlight the folks I've been working with over the years, of course. There's a great team that uh, we have had the honor, privilege, and uh, learned a lot from. My particular collaborators, Richard Bowens, Pashal Ersch, and uh, Eva LeBay. Richard is here, I think, too, giving a talk later on. A uh, great group of folks to work with. And so let me uh, set the stage a little, going back to a very nice chart that Brant Robertson put together for a Nature article in uh, 2010, just uh, sort of broadly showing the, you know, the trend of activities with time. This is the region where I'll be concentrating on for much of the new discoveries that are being made on, in galaxies at early times. And uh, this is uh, out through to Redshift 6, the first giga year. Reionization ended around redshift six. Uh, as Planck has shown us, the instantaneous redshift reionization is around 8.8 .8 or nine. Wonderful result from Planck, amazing results actually. It was a remarkable telescope. And so here we are pushing out with Hubble, 2.4 meter telescope, and then with Spitzer, an even smaller telescope, out to nearly redshift 11. This is quite astonishing, I think Fifteen years ago, if you had said that uh, these telescopes would be probing this regime, I think we all would have been extremely skeptical, probing it at the level of detail that we're actually doing. But it is astonishing that how powerful they have been. Let me just give you an image of what these galaxies look like. We talk about these in sort of very round terms, you know, 10,000 galaxies of Redshift 4 from photometric Redshift surveys. These are the sort of data we have. This is as good as it gets. So there's not a huge amount of information here. Fortunately, we have lots of information on colors. They are resolved largely, so we measure sizes, etc. But detailed structure, good survey, the very deep ones, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and ultimately when we put all that together in the XCF, candles, a superb survey. There have been surveys of clusters starting with CLASH, actually starting with the advanced camera team, put together a lot of data on clusters, frontier fields, and the parallel data sets. These have been the basis of what we've been doing. But I wanted to show you this slide, because it uh, is a very interesting one from uh, Piero and Mark's uh, re nice review last year. And uh, I don't remember, Piero, what's the model that's under here? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember which particular one it was. It doesn't matter a whole lot. Huh? Okay. So this is interesting to look at. And so particularly because these yellow regions are the candles fields. 